Our gospel reading also comes at the very beginning of one of the books of the Bible. It comes at the beginning of the book of Mark. Mark is the oldest of the gospels, the first of the gospels to have been written. And Mark opens his story with the telling of the baptism of Jesus. Hear these words. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to John and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Please pray with me. Might words spoken and words heard and the spaces in between stir us to action. My wife, Linda, is a very efficient soul. So when the last gifts have been opened, the last cards read, and all the special cookies eaten, she is ready to close up shop when it comes to Christmas. Usually the tree is down, the decorations put away, and the Christmas card list updated by the last day of December. And this year was no exception. Of course, it's not just Linda riding down Periwinkle Way. You're beginning to see various businesses have taken down their lights and decorations. In fact, it is mandated by the city of Sanibel that the lights and decorations be stripped away by this Tuesday period. And here at church, we've already begun the undecking of the halls, which will be completed after this service. Even the lectionary, that cycle of scripture readings that we follow, seems to be part of the conspiracy to end Christmas this year. For our gospel reading is from Mark, who doesn't even include a birth story in his account. He starts right off with Jesus as a full-blown adult. Yes, the holiday is over, and as some wag once put it, there's nothing quite so over as Christmas when it's over. But all that being said, let me be the first to wish you a Merry Christmas. 
I'm not getting a jump on next December. Rather, I'm recognizing the reality that for Eastern Orthodox Christians, Greek Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, Coptic Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, all those Christians, today, January 7th, is celebrated as Christmas Day. Why, you ask? Well, to make a long and very complicated story short, back in 45 BC, a revision of the Roman calendar was put in place. It came to be known as the Julian calendar due to the fact that Julius Caesar was emperor at the time. In the following century, the Christian church was founded, but then a thousand years after that, the church split into two. The Western Church centered on Rome, and the Eastern Church centered on Constantinople. The Western Church came to be known as the Roman Catholic Church. The Church in the East was known as the Eastern Orthodox Church. 500 years after all that, in 1582, the calendar was out of whack by about 12 days. So Pope Gregory XIII ordered another revision, and that calendar came to be known as the Gregorian calendar. But by then, of course, the Eastern Church wasn't interested at all in what the Roman Pope's opinion was about anything, much less calendars. So they continued to follow the Julian calendar. So there you have it. Merry Christmas. All that said, however, I suspect Eastern Orthodox people are probably as quick to put away Christmas as you and I often seem to be. Maybe the poet W.H. Auden was right, and we're just plain tuckered out. Well, so that is that, he wrote. Now we must dismantle the tree, putting the decorations back into their cardboard boxes, some have gotten broken, and carrying them up to the attic. The holly and mistletoe must be taken down and burnt, and the children got ready for school. There are enough leftovers to do warmed up for the rest of the week. Not that we have much appetite, having drunk such a lot, stayed up so late, attempted quite unsuccessfully to love all of our relatives and in general grossly overestimated our powers. Maybe Auden is right. Maybe we really want to be done with it for another year and get back to our normal routine. Maybe we just want to wrap up the nativity stories like figurines from a crash and store them away until next December. James Steen recalls a time when his son Harrison was just three years old. James and his wife were sharing with young Harrison about how much he was loved by Jesus. I asked Harrison, says Steen, if he knew where Jesus lived, assuming he might say in heaven or, or in my heart. Harrison pondered the question for a moment, and then he thought of the crash, and he said, I know, Jesus lives in the basement. Okay, so it's Florida. We don't put anything in our non-existent basements. But we might put our Christmas paraphernalia in the garage or a storage unit, don't you wish you had invested in storage units 20 years ago? Just so long as we can get on with our lives. Yes, here in the West, Christmas seems long over, even though it was only a few days ago. And in the East, it will seem that way soon enough. But it ain't over yet. It's not ever over. Never. For just because we wrap up the baubles and the figurines, just because we put away the trappings of Christmas, 
That doesn't mean we should put away its meaning. That doesn't mean we should put away the lessons it has taught us. For it has taught us many things once again. In telling us about Mary and Joseph coping with the pending birth of Jesus, these stories show us how to trust in God. In recounting the messages conveyed by angels and through dreams, these stories tell us to listen, really listen, for the many ways God is speaking to us. In the one sentence, one single sentence reference to the innkeeper in Bethlehem, we are reminded to keep a door open in our hearts. In the delightful story about the lowly shepherds, we are prompted to remember that God cares even for the lowliest of the low. In the Epiphany story of the Magi, we are called to be willing to seek out the truth no matter what the cost. In the gifts that they presented, we are shown how to honor God with our very best. And even in the story of evil King Herod, there is a lesson. For we are shown there how power can corrupt. And we are reminded that Christmas is not simply about peace on earth, but also about justice for all. Yes, in this simple tale of the manger, we are taught many things. And we are called anew to give birth to love and peace and grace and goodness within ourselves. Not just in late December, but all year long. Robert Russell tells about a time when a house in his subdivision seemed to ignore the passing of the Christmas season and kept their lights and decorations long past the first of the year. Their twinkling lights burned every night during the coldest parts of winter. When President's Day rolled around, Russell found himself more and more disgruntled about the whole thing. If I were too lazy to take my Christmas lights down, he thought to himself, I think I'd at least turn them off at night. But the lights stayed up and stayed on. February turned into March, when one day, Russell spotted a sign outside that house, a sign that explained the whole thing. For in that era of the Vietnam War, it simply said, welcome home, Jimmy. Welcome home. We needn't be like Robert Russell's neighbors. We needn't keep the literal lights burning on our trees and around our doorways but we can and should keep the light of God's love, which is made so very clear in these Advent and Christmas and Epiphany stories. We should keep that light burning brightly in our lives every day, every month, all year through. Perhaps it is no better said than in the words of another poet, Anne Weems, she writes, it's not over this birthing. There are always newer skies into which God can throw the stars. 
We begin to think that we can predict the advent of God, that we can box the Christ in a stable in Bethlehem. That's just the time that God will be born, born in a place we can't imagine or won't believe. Those who wait for God watch with their hearts and not their eyes, listening, always listening for angel words. Yes, we can and we must go down to the river with Mark and witness the baptism of Jesus. Yes, we can and must set out as we trace the story of his ministry. But as we venture into this new year, let us not forget the lessons of Christmas. Let us trust the Holy One, like Joseph and Mary. Let us listen for God and keep our hearts open. Let us care for all people and seek out the truth. Let us offer God our best gifts and work for peace and justice. December 25th may have come and gone, but Christmas, it ain't over yet. It never is.